Welcome to Deep Dive Defense, military and aerospace enthusiasts. Over here we give rare insights you won't hear elsewhere. Today, we take a look at the individual ballistic missiles Iran employed in its strikes against Israel and the corresponding ballistic missile defenses utilized by Israel and the United States to counter them. Each type of ballistic missile Iran used and each type of ballistic missile interceptor Israel employed to counter them will be assessed, beginning with the most dangerous missile types and the highest end ballistic missile defenses. Like and subscribe to the channel as it celebrates its one year anniversary, it makes a big difference. So let's start. The highest end ballistic missile Iran claimed to have used during the strikes of Operation True Promise 3 is the Fatah 1 hypersonic ballistic missile. Against this unique weapon, only the U.S. THAAD missile defense system possesses some credible chance of interception. Other missile defenses, such as the David Sling, have some minimal chances if launched in high-quantity emergency ripple launches. However, the kill probability against the FATA-1 using such systems would be so low that attempting to engage that threat with anything other than the U.S. THAAD system would make no economic sense. This explains why Israel formally requested the deployment of the THAAD system following Operation True Promise 2 in October 2024. The U.S. deployed two of its rare THAAD batteries to southern Israel in anticipation of the next conflict, which then occurred in June 2025. At nearly 13 million U.S. dollars per interceptor missile, THAAD is among the most expensive interceptor types globally. This cost is due to its unique capability to execute thruster-assisted terminal phase hit to kill interception both inside and outside the Earth's atmosphere. To enable this dual capability, the THAAD system is equipped with an aerodynamically shaped seeker window actively cooled to permit its infrared seeker to engage targets within the upper layers of Earth's atmosphere. Since the FATA-1 enters the engagement envelope of ballistic missile defenses while actively maneuvering inside the atmosphere, only the high-speed THAAD has realistic chances of effective interception, particularly if employed late in the engagement at short range. Here, its thrust vector control system can maneuver the interceptor close to the incoming FATA-1, and the thruster-equipped kill vehicle enables rapid course corrections necessary to keep pace with the randomly maneuvering FATA-1 propelled hypersonic glider. Nevertheless, it is believed that the FATA-1's high endgame velocity and maneuvering may be sufficient to defeat the THAAD interceptor, even when launched at very short ranges. Consequently, it appears the FATA-1 launches might have been intended to neutralize the THAAD system's radar, specifically the AN-TPY-2 X-band missile defense radar. Because the battery itself would be under direct attack, THAAD interceptors could be launched at extremely close ranges where they possess their highest energy state. Therefore, only a ballistic missile exhibiting a kinematic overmatch like the FATA-1 has a realistic chance of striking the critical radar system with a single missile. One tier below the FATA-1, on place 2, is the Kbar Shekhan-2 aeroballistic missile. This missile is confirmed to have been used during the strikes and shares many characteristics with the aforementioned FATA-1. Its primary difference lies in its lower terminal velocity, as it lacks the integrated propulsion system within its glider which the FATA-1 has. This results in reduced maneuverability for defeating ballistic missile defense systems and more rapid deceleration, bringing it within the engagement envelope of less advanced missile defenses than just the US THAAD. While the FATA-1 is assessed to maintain hypersonic velocity, exceeding Mach 5 upon impact, following intense evasive maneuvering, the K-Bar Shikon-2 is suspected to decelerate below the Mach 5 threshold by the time of impact. Notably, it is believed that missiles exhibiting heat shield malfunctions during terminal descent were predominantly K-Bar Shikan-2. This occurred because they were operating at approximately 1,300 km instead of their designed nominal range of 1,800 km. Their high-tech small radius nose tips are fabricated from 3D carbon-carbon composites, representing an exceptionally difficult to master subsystem required for a missile like the K-Bar Shikan-2. However, to enhance its probability of defeating the U.S. THAAD system, the K-Bar Shikan-2 glider would execute a steeper, faster dive into the atmosphere to preserve a higher energy state and avoid entering the effective engagement envelope of Israel's David Sling Ballistic Missile Defense System. Consequently, this high-velocity rapid descent strategy is assessed to have caused the observed heat shield failures. Nevertheless, 
The high speed and energy state meant the missile possessed a significant likelihood of overcoming Thod interception attempts. It is further believed that the majority of Thod interceptor launches were directed against K-Bar Shekin-2 missiles, with approximately 150 launches reported. It is likely that the shorter range and correspondingly higher speed trajectories flown by the K-Bar Shekan actually enabled it to defeat Thod interceptors more effectively. Attribution for the third rank is more contested, but it is believed the Sejil medium-range ballistic missile represents the third most challenging Iranian ballistic missile to intercept. Although just two Sejil missiles were reportedly employed during the strikes, more as a visually spectacular demonstration for Iran's domestic audience, the Sejil is assessed to utilize two principal strategies to defeat ballistic missile defenses. Specifically, its high velocity combined with interference against missile defense guidance systems. Its high speed keeps it outside the engagement envelope of systems like David's Sling, Patriot Pac-3, and Iron Dome. Its capability to release its submunition warhead while outside the atmosphere also defeats the Aero 2 system. Therefore, the systems capable of intercepting the Sejil are the Thod, the Aero 3, and the US Standard Missile 3. These exo-atmospheric interceptors possess, in principle, a favorable probability of intercepting the Sejil's non-maneuvering ballistic re-entry vehicle. Unlike the Fatah-1 and K-Bar Shekhan-2, the Sejil flies predominantly outside the atmosphere for the majority of its flight. As the Sejil was designed as a high-end asset within Iran's missile forces, it is believed to deploy not only a relatively high number of exo-atmospheric inflatable decoys, but also a jamming system to interfere with critical ballistic missile defense radars. If Fatah-1 hypersonic missiles successfully neutralized the Thad system's AN-TPY-2 radars early in the conflict, the sensor performance of the overall missile defense network could have significantly degraded, sufficiently so to enable the nearly 20-year-old Sejil missiles to defeat exo-atmospheric interceptors and their remaining S-band guidance radars through the combination of decoys and jamming. Whether the launched Sejil missiles utilized a previously unknown maneuvering re-entry vehicle or merely deployed submunitions, shortly before entering the engagement envelopes of endo-atmospheric interceptors like the Aero 2, remains unknown. Fourth place is similarly contested but should be assigned to the Etimad liquid propellant medium-range missile system. The Etimad is an improved EMAD ballistic missile featuring longer range and correspondingly higher velocity, likely along with a jammer and inflatable decoys, comparable to the previously mentioned Sejil. The quality of these countermeasures is assessed to be superior to those of its predecessor, the Amad missile. However, it operates at a somewhat lower velocity than the Sejil, while using a direct descent maneuverable re-entry vehicle. The Etimad is therefore a modified variant of the Emad, with extended range and refinements specifically engineered to defeat Israel's exo-atmospheric Aero 3 system. Its maneuverable hypersonic terminal speed re-entry vehicle also defeats the David Sling and Iron Dome systems and possesses favorable odds against the Israeli Aero 2. Consequently, the US Thad with its high-end X-band radar and the standard Missile 3 emerge as the primary means to intercept the Etimad, beside the Aero 3 two of the most expensive U.S. interceptors used during the conflict. The fifth rank in this comparison, while also subject to debate, should belong to the K-Bar Shekan-1 aeroballistic missile. Its distinction from the K-Bar Shekan-2 lies in its significantly shorter glide time and much more rapid deceleration, which slows the glider down to supersonic speeds. This contrasts with the near hypersonic speeds maintained by the K-Bar Shekan-2 when employed at reduced ranges. This characteristic means the K-Bar Shekin-1 remains on a ballistic trajectory for a longer duration, without the ability to maneuver in the vacuum of space, thereby enabling potential interception by the Aero-3 and Standard Missile 3 interceptors, as well as the high-performance THAAD system. The K-Bar Shekin-1's rapid deceleration to supersonic speeds also signifies that, despite evasive maneuvering, it enters the engagement envelope of the David Sling. It is further possible that even high-quantity ripple launches of Iron Dome Tamir interceptors could achieve a successful hit. Conversely, this slowing down during the terminal phase to more comfortable supersonic speeds also means that the K-Bar Shekan-1 is employed for missions demanding high accuracy. 
its larger diameter nose tip additionally implies that its heat shield is less likely to fail, compared to that of the K-Bar Shikan 2. Sixth place belongs to the EMAD liquid propellant heavy warhead ballistic missile, generally very similar to the previously mentioned Etimad missile. As the predecessor to the Etimad, the EMAD primarily faces Israel's Arrow 3 system. The EMAD's principal strategy for defeating the Arrow 3 and Standard Missile 3 relies on higher-tier Iranian missiles neutralizing high-resolution X-band radar sensors, such as the aforementioned AN-TPY2, before the EMAD is launched. Once the sensor network and its discrimination capability are degraded, it is believed inflatable decoys are deployed to defeat systems like the Arrow 3, while the missile is outside the atmosphere on an ordinary ballistic trajectory. If such sensor degradation is achieved, the missile defense network's degraded state would also prevent effective discrimination between actual warheads and the separated empty boosters of all Iranian missiles, ranging from the Fatah one to the EMAD. This would effectively double interceptor expenditure as defenses attempt to intercept the useless, empty first-stage boosters, a phenomenon often observed during the conflict. The Ahmad's strategy for defeating endo-atmospheric interceptors such as David's Sling, Iron Dome, and even Arrow 2, is similar to the Etimad. Namely, the direct hypersonic descent of its maneuverable re-entry vehicle. However, this strategy also results in lower accuracy, due to the actuator response time dynamic effects of the aerodynamic steering surfaces. This reduced accuracy is compensated for by the EMAD's nearly one-ton warhead, making it suitable for attacking large area targets instead of small, hardened ones. Seventh place belongs to the improved Goddard variants equipped with maneuverable re-entry vehicles. These exist in two variants. One similar to the Etimad missile's maneuverable re-entry vehicle for the Goddard F variant, which is rated for higher terminal velocity, and an older, simpler design for the Goddard H variant, designed for lower terminal speed. These upgraded Gator variants are very similar to the related Etimad and EMAD missiles, and also primarily face exo-atmospheric interceptors like the Arrow 3 and Standard Missile 3. It is believed the more advanced variant for the Goddard F also employs terminal evasive maneuvering to defeat the Arrow 2, David's Sling, and Iron Dome systems, while the older variant for the Goddard H likely lacks this feature, making interception by a system like Arrow 2 more probable. The 8th rank belongs to the standard Goddard H variant equipped with its submunition warhead, fitting the traditional definition of a ballistic missile. Equipped with an unguided re-entry vehicle, this relatively old missile was used in the later stages of the conflict when Iran was confident enough to employ this system, despite its longer setup time and relatively large detectable footprint. The Goddard H's low accuracy is compensated for by its submunition warhead, which also makes it a counter-value weapon useful for retaliatory strikes against non-military targets. In this context, several strikes by submunition warhead-equipped Gadar H missiles were observed, with systems like Arrow 3 failing to intercept, likely due to the low remaining interceptor arsenal available at that late conflict stage. While the Goddard H is a relatively easy target for exo-atmospheric interceptors like Arrow 3 and Standard Missile 3, another explanation for interception failure is also plausible. Namely, the early exo-atmospheric release of submunitions while still in space. If the dispersion is effectively managed and the target area sufficiently large, this defeat technique can virtually overcome all missile defenses leaving each individual submunitions to be targeted by endo-atmospheric systems like David's Sling and Iron Dome, a highly cost-inefficient method for the defender to counter such attacks by the Goddard. Some of the interceptions credited to the Iron Dome's Tamir Interceptor may be attributed to these exo-atmospherically released submunitions, which slow down significantly enough at re-entry to enter Iron Dome's engagement envelope. The ninth and final rank belongs to an unspecified Iranian missile type, 14 of which succeeded in defeating more than 40 Patriot Pac-3 interceptors, managing to cut the secure communication link of the U.S. Central Command to the U.S. homeland. These 14 Iranian missiles, launched in retaliation for U.S. strikes against Iran's nuclear facilities, could potentially be the Fatah 313, also designated the F variant. The Zohair Aeroballistic Missile the Qiyam liquid propellant missile, or one of its sub-variants, such as the Jihad, 
potentially equipped with a maneuverable re-entry vehicle. Notable in this engagement is that the targeted al Udaid Air Base was directly protected by Patriot missile defense batteries, and Iran deliberately restricted the missile quantity to 14, mirroring the 14 munitions reportedly used by the U.S. during its strikes. Despite the launch of over 40 Patriot Pac-3 interceptors, the largest such engagement in history, at least one of the 14 Iranian missiles managed to strike a very high-value target, critical to the entire U.S. Central Command's communication. Most likely, a combination of Fatah 313 missiles and a small number of Zohar short-range aeroballistic missiles were employed in that specific operation. Having examined all nine ranks of Iranian missile systems utilized in the conflict, along with the Israeli and U.S. missile defense systems suited to counter them, two inevitable observations happen. The first concerns the list of operational Iranian missile systems capable of reaching Israel that were intentionally not used. The second is on the status of U.S. and Israeli missile defense interceptor stockpiles. The list of Iran's missiles in operational service with the capability to reach Israel is extensive and includes the Khorramshahr 2 and Khorramshahr 4, the Jihad and Rezvan, the Dezful and Hajj Qasim, the Shahab 3 and Ghadar S, and likely even more. The majority of these missiles cost approximately 100,000 to 150,000 US dollars per unit. Only the more advanced systems, such as the Khorramshahr family, Sejil, and the Fata 1 hypersonic ballistic missile, cost notably more, with all three estimated to be well below $500,000 each. These Iranian missile prices stand in stark contrast to the costs of missile interceptors employed by Israel. The Iron Dome's Tamir interceptor costs approximately $150,000 per missile and were in some cases launched in literal dozens against a single target, such as the less capable K-Bar Shaken one and Ghadr's sub-munitions, of which approximately a dozen are released by each missile warhead. At around $600,000, the stunner interceptor utilized by the David's Sling system already exceeds the cost of Iran's most advanced missile used, the Fata-1 hypersonic ballistic missile while possessing no credible chance of intercepting it. A substantial jump occurs to three to four million US dollars for the Arrow 3, Arrow 2, and Patriot Pac-3 interceptors. Then another significant cost increase is observed with the US THAAD system interceptor, priced at approximately 13 million US dollars per missile due to its high-end but complex technological solutions. This in turn renders it the most effective interceptor utilized by Israel during the conflict. Thad costs more than 40 times the estimated price of Iran's Fatah-1, which represents the most advanced and expensive missile Iran employed during the conflict. The U.S. Standard Missile 3 variant used during the conflict has a similar cost to the Thad at more than $10 million per missile, with the most advanced variant, the Block 2, reaching about $30 million a shot. In conclusion, it is evident that Iran deliberately restricted its firepower against nuclear-armed Israel and likely employed a strategy focused on sensor degradation by striking critical radars within the missile defense network, followed by interceptor depletion. This was achieved by utilizing high-velocity missiles like the K-Bar Shekhan-2 to lure multiple interceptor launches against single ballistic missile threats. Subsequently, the sensor-degraded network would also engage the separated empty booster stages further depleting the remaining interceptor stocks. Twelve days of missile defense operations reportedly exhausted at least 150 or one-fourth of the U.S. THAAD stocks accumulated over decades, as well as 80 even rarer SM-3. It is believed that the stocks of the critical Aero-3 have run into much more dangerously low levels. This deliberate attrition warfare strategy resulted in a ceasefire reportedly requested by the Israeli side after just 12 days of conflict, without achieving the primary objective set for the initial surprise attack. The high unit cost and low slow production pace of such advanced interceptors means that Israel and the US will require a considerable period to replenish the depleted stocks. Hence, this reality renders any further large-scale strike against Iran a logistically impractical and strategically irrational course of action. So that's all for today. If you liked it, give a thumbs up, comment, and subscribe. It really makes a difference in the YouTube algorithm and is a great support to the channel.
the real enthusiast can become members and given access to exciting membership area material. Thanks for your support and motivation. See you next time.